to cracks. Which, of course, then mean that, that to avoid a future bubble, it's not only about controlling the money supply, but also the credit, which leads us that one of the major key we have to use in the future much more actively than we did in the past is capital requirements. De facto, if you take the Basel II uh, agreements, the Basel II rules, I see two problems with them. The one is that it's a voluntarily system de facto in the sense that the central banks, they can use it or they can use part of it, but it, they are not obliged to do it. And, and the second point is that the capital requirements built into the Basel II regime, uh, they, it's, it's, very, it's very constantly on the same level, if you like, which means that it's risking being pro-cyclical, which again means that when things are going up, these capital requirements are strengthening that things goes up, not the other way around. That's why capital requirement, you will hear when I come to, to the substance, must be one of our major or most important keys to avoid future crises. My, my next uh, observation is the systemic risks. I think that at the top of uh, the capital requirements to avoid future crises, we need to, to really to invest in avoiding systemic risks. That has to do with the herd effects. That has to do with a simple thing, as you can see, that if you are an individual player, if you are a fund manager of a hedge fund or a private equity or a, another shadow banking actor, you always look at yourself as an individual, if you like. And when guys like me come and talk about the macro level, you, you, you're shouting your head and say, what, what are you talking about? Me, hedge fund manager, I will always be on the right side, but he's forgetting uh, that, that the other guys, they will also be on, on that same side as him, which of course means that the herd effect will still be there. In a sense, you can argue as an individual hedge fund manager, I can manage, what are you caring about? I can sell and buy today, yeah, that's true, but what if all the others are on the same side as you? Then you cannot say sell and buy. That's why we need to have a systemic risk management and supervisory activity which can avoid that we are coming in, into situations like we've just passed. I think also that, 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 that we have to, to recognize that the product market has to be changed fundamentally. Lord Turner, in, in one of his interventions in the FSA in London, have said that part of the market is social useless. And he is absolutely right. If you, for instance, take the credit default swap market, you can on the one hand say, and here again you, you see in, in, in the debates in Financial Times or, or in the big journals or, or on, on, on the internet, you see that behind the disagreement, I have observed often that this is also an, a discussion between the macro and, and the micro level. Because if you are a lawyer or you are a, an ex expert dealing with creating new credit default swaps, you don't understand what I'm talking about. I mean, you're making practical business. It's a bet market, and you're making the bets uh, as good as you can, and you're making your products as good as you can. So what is Paul Rasmussen talking about? Well, I'm talking about the following. If we look at the credit defa default swap market just before it broke down, it was globally around $50 trillion, maybe $55 trillion, $55,000 billion. Okay? And, and some would say, well, what's wrong with that, Paul? My answer is, it's only about 10% of this market, of credit default swap market, which is related to what you could call real economic uh, raison d'etre. It's clear that an international company uh, in the real economy, having international positions, of course, wants to ensure itself, to cover itself, for changes in relations between currencies. That's clear enough. And to do that, you make a credit default swap. Fine. Problem that 90% of the credit default swaps don't deal with what, what, what is in the real economy. When you have made one credit default swap as a company manager to cover uh, <coughs> changes and, and instabilities on your export markets, uh, then the next one is to make a new credit default swap of the credit default swap you just mentioned, and net, net a, ne a new credit default swap, and before you at the end, you will see that this market has exploded. Historically, 
That was, of course, also why the Americans closed that market uh, in, uh, in uh, quite a long number of years. I think it was during Bill Clinton that the market was open again. And I just want to, to pose a big question on this market, credit default swap. Is that really social useful? Yes, it's social useful as far as the insurance capacity is concerned, directly related to the companies of the real economy. But at the top of that, I follow George Soros and Lord Turner and say, is that really worthwhile? OK, Paul, if you can't just forbid it, what can you do then? Well, what I could do would be to say, those managers who have fiduciary responsibility, for instance, those who administer other people's money, like pension funds, is it really worthwhile for them to put money into that kind of stuff? Either credit default swaps or other credit derivatives of the same kind, which are very opaque projects, where it's very, very difficult to see the relation between the risk and the price. I just pose that question because remember that the pen pension funds have lost huge amount of money uh, these days, and the wage earners putting their, their, their saving into the pension fund just stand here and say, what, what's happening with my saving? We saw it on the extreme case in Iceland, but you, the Iceland is, is in that case not a, a single uh, player on, on, on this earth. But again, when I talk about regulating the product market or regulating um, the shadow banking market or making new capital requirements to the banking sector, I see a very, very heavy reaction. Partly of the, the, the reason I mentioned micro-macro, but also of other reasons. The city of London uh, is fighting hard to avoid EU regulation, very, very hard. In my long time as politicians also operating at the European market and the European level here in the EU institutions, also in my former job as Prime Minister, I've never seen such a hard lobbying as I see these days. I could simply, don't, I could simply not understand why the Mayor of London was so busy coming to Brussels arguing f against any regulation for the hedge funds and private equity industry. I mean, in all humbleness, I imagine that the mayor of London had anything, have something else to do over there, I mean. And then I begin to study what's going on here. And then I observed that 77% of the mayor's election budget at the last municipality election, 77% was financed by the hedge funds and private equity industry in, in city. And then I understood why the guy had so busy times here in Brussels. I'm sorry, I'm just mentioning it to you. No, I'm not sorry. I'm saying it's not that simple that it's, it's, it's argument versus argument. It's also heavy, heavy interest and lobbyism we see here. And by the way, if I go into the committees in the commission and see who's in these commissions uh, or committees forming the projects and forming the proposal for regulating the financial market, and it, one, it has been very difficult to come into these committees and see the composition. But when I look to the composition in the committees, in the commission, forming the proposals to regulate, I see in many of the committees that you have more, the number of lobbyists are, are higher than the civil servants from the commission. And, and, and again, if you ask, well, Paul, were you there? Or were there some trade unions there? I would say a typical uh, committee is consisting uh, around, I would say 60% of the members of these committees come from the lobby industry, 40% or 35% comes from civil servant, and around 5% come from other, either independent or from trade union side or labor side, whatever you prefer. If you want the documents, you can, your documentation, you can have it. So, I want to underline that to you because that belongs to uh, a true picture of the effort of regulating also, I think. Let me, let me then just, just line up by saying we need to regulate in the future on the following principles. Number one, first, it must be comprehensive. It must cover all financial institutions and instruments and players without exception. And luckily enough, Last year, I managed to make a report in the European Parliament based on that principle. 
It's a 